So where we left off was talking about applets. So what came after applets was various plugins like Flash, like uh, Silverlight, QuickTime, all those. Uh, they did a lot of neat things. Uh, the big one was they used fractional pixels. So that made the graphics much prettier. If you resize the window or if you developed one base screen and you tried to run it on other devices, the graphics still looked pretty good. Unfortunately, plugins still suffered from the same basic security problems as applets. So let's talk about that. Now, what is the fundamental problem? Well, anytime you have your browser, you'll have some associated data for using whatever website you're on, okay? So things like session token, right? Basically access credentials and potentially other saved sensitive data. All that's going to get stored in your browser. It needs to be there. For example, every time you go to a site and you access it through your uh, stored password, in some sense, your browser is storing that password, right? Anytime you go from one page on a site to an another without re-logging in, that's because your browser has this session token. So all that data is stored in your browser. Now, if you have another application, right? So here's your browser. If all of this is going through your browser, there's no problem. There's no other application that's going to tap into your browser. All your browser is doing is going to some, connecting to some web server saying, here I am, send me stuff. And the web server is sending the stuff back and the browser is displaying it. So if the web server is secure, nobody's hacked into that or done anything bad with the pages and the browser is secure, right? So there's no applications on your side. There's no malware that's common it, for example, then everything's fine. However, once you start bringing in other applications into the mix, then all that becomes a lot dicier. Because what, what can happen? Well, the basic problem is this. Other apps, let me finish with my artwork here, such as it is. Any of these other apps can potentially access that sensitive information. For example, if you have a video player or a game player like uh, Macromedia Flash, right, that get, got used for a lot of Facebook games back in the day. There we go. For example, Flash could have a vulnerability that allows a malicious uh, actor to steal your Facebook session key. Okay. And Flash, in fact, did have a number of these vulnerabilities. So in various ways, this uh, Flash player might be trying to do some legitimate stuff but it can peek at various things. For example, if there's a game on Facebook that you're playing and you go from one screen to the next or it needs to access some personal information for you, like your list of friends or your list of high scores, whatever, yeah, it's going to have access to some of that browser data. And the problem fundamentally is it's really hard for automated security tools and what are called tools and features, what are called sandboxing, for example, to block everything, right? The short version is designers miss stuff. In a well-designed application, sure, these things shouldn't be a problem, but not all applications, not all systems are well-designed. Well so let's add in a little bit of text here. Plug-in two, plug-in three, whatever these things are, we don't really care. So the bottom line on this, anytime you allow one of these outside applications to access some of this potentially sensitive data in your browser, there's a possibility that some sort of malicious actor could use that to grab data in transit and say, ah, here's what I see that you're using on Facebook. 
Maybe I redirect you to another site and try to get you to log in there. Maybe I just uh, have a little bit of uh, spyware on your machine that eavesdrops when you send that session token to Facebook and it cre create a copy of it. Things like that can happen. Okay. So anyway, we'll talk more in a second. So the current status, applets for all practical purposes are gone and they've been almost entirely gone for about 10 years now. Now for plugins, plugin content still exists. So you can still find some uh, games on Facebook that haven't been updated to not use Flash, for example. But most browsers stopped actively supporting plugins a few years ago. So it's no longer included as a default option. You have to specifically opt in to use Flash and it'll give you some warning like uh, Microsoft Edge lately has been saying, yeah, support for Flash is going away in December. So yeah, plugin content still exists, but they're more or less on the way out. Okay, so how the security problem happens, again, this plugin is a separate application from your browser and it often needs access to information the browser uses. Now, if it's a legitimate plugin, you can probably trust it. I mean, the guys that make Flash, they're not designing it to steal information, but if there's a bad one, right, it could steal information. So here's a fun one from back in the day, a little bit of story. So for a long time, Mac did not, Macs did not allow people to install Flash. They said, you know, this is kind of junky, it's bad software, uh, there's all sorts of security vulnerabilities in it, and part of the Apple, you know, cachet is that we're, we don't have a lot of malware affecting us. But people really wanted to play these Flash-based browser games, and so Apple eventually relented and said, yeah, okay, we can do, we can do this. But before that happened, there was an operation that came up with a bit of software called Flashback. It's essentially a Flash clone, but when you installed it as an administrator, right, you installed it and said, yes, I'm gonna let this application do stuff on my machine. You basically gave this malware the keys to your operation. And you can look at this. So Flashback form of malware designed to grab passwords and other information from users through their web browser. Okay, it's gonna grab all the stuff you're using and send it to the bad guys. And how many people did it infect? Uh, over half a million, as I recall. There we go. Uh, more than 600,000 Macs infected with the Flashback botnet. Okay. Reason is, people really wanted Flash. It looked good enough, right? It looked like, oh, yeah, okay, Flash player installer. Sure, this is fine. I want to install it. And people did, but instead they directly installed malware. Very unfortunate. But these are the sort of things that happen. Okay. Now, as far as security, again, all complex ha systems have vulnerabilities, and we've established way early on that if there's a mechanism to get into a system, there's a possibility that the system can be hacked in some way, right? There's no such thing as perfect security. If a gateway into the system exists, there's some way for the bad guys to get control of that gateway. Now, any kind of complex system, and these uh, software packages, they are pretty complex, they're all gonna have vulnerabilities. So here's the particular problem with plugins and browsers. Number one, automated detection, it's really hard because a lot of plugins attacks do things that at least some plugins ought to be able to do. There are various cases where plugins, yeah, they ought to be able to access your session key in order to you know, move freely about the website. It makes sense, okay? That makes it very difficult to just develop a rule that says, oh, this plugin cannot access this sensitive data. Uh, number two, Plugin developers, historically, they were a lot less concerned about finding and fixing problems. They worked, uh, they emphasized the graphic side, and yeah, they paid some attention to security, but honestly, it wasn't their big thing. I guess they had the uh, line of thought that, well, it's the browser's problem or it's Facebook's problem. You know, it's not uh, something that we're going to really work that hard to fix, perhaps. And the other thing, proliferation of plugin software. So there are a lot of different plugins there. Again, just uh, the big three, maybe Flash and uh, Silverlight and QuickTime, but there were many others. And all of those multiplied the number of ways things could go wrong. So again, for any of those plugins that you got, they all had their own interesting vulnerabilities and the bad guys could chase after them. Okay. Now, as far as security threats, we have a little, uh, sidelight here, target selection theory. So some of you may have heard of Willie Sutton. If you ask maybe your grandparents, they might have heard of him. So he was a famous bank robber during the golden era of bank robbery in the United States was, you know, maybe about 1920 to 1940. It was kind of a, you know, kind of a thing to do. 
Well, he finally got caught, and the cops asked him, how come you rob banks? And his response, his immortal response was, because that's where the money is. Well, same kind of thing with the bad guys doing this sort of uh, browser vulnerabilities. What's driving their selection? Well, basically, they want to target where the money is. So key things. If, you're, if it takes you a given amount of effort to design you know, some sort of exploit, first of all, you're going to look at popularity. It's much better to target a popular browser or a popular component, a popular website, popular operating system. So you'll get more potential targets. Number two, the value of the information itself. So if you hack somebody's Facebook account and you can, you know, send their, uh, I don't know, you can send whatever inappropriate messages to their grandmother, or you can send some, you know, uh, spear fish, some phishing attacks, whatever. Yeah, that has a little bit of value, but honestly not that much because you can always just send phishing attacks to batches of ordinary email anyway. So that sort of thing doesn't have too much value. However, if you have access to somebody's bank account or somebody's credit card information, that has a lot of value. So different kinds of information have different values. Last, the timing, the likelihood of the attack being successful. And that depends in part on the novelty of the attack, the attack, how uh, rigorous people have been about installing patches. Yeah, so if you can get an attack that hits all of those things, hits a popular target, uh, get some valuable information from it, and the timing is good, if it's what's called a zero-day attack, which means it hasn't been seen before, then all of those, you'll probably get some good benefit out of it I mean, as a bad guy. So broadly speaking, the attack value is the number of target machines times the probability of success per machine times the expected return per, mach per infected machine, okay? Anyway, regardless of the actual vulnerability prevalence, Rational attackers are going to focus on high value attacks. So if there's some junky website that, yeah, maybe the security isn't good, but there's nothing really of value there, then they're probably going to pass it by. Why should they even bother, right? They might uh, draw attention to themselves. They might uh, trigger a patch for a vulnerability they could use more effectively elsewhere. Yeah, rational attackers, they're going to try to get the most bang for their buck in terms of their uh, criminal activity. Okay. Now, how does this apply to actual history? Well, once upon a time, applets were popular and they were attacked. And then it shifted over to other plugins. So we'll talk about this for a moment. Let's uh, do a little historical graph and we'll see why the world is the way it is. So we'll do a few breakpoints for years here. So 2000 and we'll do 2005, 2010, over here 2015 which was the beginning of the end for uh plugins so once upon a time let's look at uh usage is going to be well, let's do usage in green and then attacks in red okay so what happened first for applets looked something like this. So they were pretty big in 2000. Right? I don't know, maybe they're probably getting bigger, but around 2005, they started to taper off substantially and basically vanished down to about nothing by, ooh, by 2010. Reason was, right, Flash Player uh, and the other big plugins came in around that time. All right, so I'll say applets. Okay, now, as far as attacks, it took a while, but eventually the number of attacks, you know, was pretty high up there as well. And the logic of this, whoop, let's see. Try to make it look good. Sure, that'll go. Whatever. Uh, by the time applets were popular, right, the number of attacks were also starting to crest. And by the time applets were in decline, the number of attacks on them were also starting to decline. So I'll say here, number of attacks rises and falls with applet popularity. Okay. Well, what happens with 
the same thing, all right? Same thing happens with Flash. Right around here, around 2005, they're starting to get very popular. We want to do, you can be that color. Not that sharp. Okay, around here, Flash is starting to get very popular. But what's the problem? Well, in 2005, people see the state of applets. They see applets and say, oh, look at that, applets. They're horrible. There are all these vulnerabilities. I don't want to use applets, right? But Flash, well, they haven't been around that long. Nobody's bothered to write a lot of exploits against Flash yet because the bad guys, you know, number one, it takes them a while to write the exploits. Number two, they're not sure what's going to be popular. But until Flash genuinely does become popular, there's going to be a lot, there aren't going to be that many attacks against it. By the end, right, let's do that in pink. By 2010, zoop, sure, you're starting to see some more. I should do that as a two piece. Whatever. Zoom the number of uh, attacks. Damn it. This is harder than it looks. Many attacks. Target Flash. Okay. At that point, Flash has been very popular. Applets are kind of gone away, and people are starting to realize, oh man, look at all these attacks hitting Flash. This is a problem. So, in the end, Flash kind of starts to go away as well. It comes back down around here, 2015. It starts to crunch down. Browsers, you know, don't uh, don't support it that much. And here we are now. So what eventually happened right around here, HTML5 takes over Flash property, Flash uh, features. So what we'll see in a moment, HTML5, the new generation of HTML, takes over a whole lot of things that used to be done by Flash specifically for better graphics. That's the big thing. and native video streaming. So once upon a time, you needed some plugin to play videos, but HTML5, it could do that directly through the browser. And this is much more secure, much more secure because no plugin application is needed. Okay, you can just do it straight through your browser. But this is what happened over time. Applets were popular by the time Flash came around, there were a lot of attacks targeting applets, so that was one more thing. People said, yeah, not only are the graphics bad, but look at all these attacks. So Flash took over, and then same thing, right? Flash had been around for a little while. There were a lot of attacks targeting Flash, and then the browser guy said, you know what? We're going to do a new generation of HTML that's going to take over a lot of these features that Flash has because it's just creating too many vulnerabilities to allow these plugins to join in. Okay. Do, 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 do. So here we go. Any technology uh, used across platforms is always going to be especially enticing. Java applets, because Java is platform independent, a Java application can run on any Java capable machine once you've installed that Java virtual machine. If you could find an exploit against Java, that's great. You could affect every machine. Plugins, again, that are compatible with multiple operating systems or with just very popular ones like Windows, yeah, those are also going to be good targets. And of course, phishing later on. So once uh, these sort of attacks on plugins started to go away because of better security and because of HTML5, phishing attacks began to get much more popular because again, you devise one phishing attack, you can send it the same way to any sort of email account. You design one attack to hit a lot of targets. It's very, uh, very nice for the attackers. Now, the alternative to this is scripting. Right. If you uh, now HTML, uh, the Flash Player does work to an extent in JavaScript, but it is a separate application. But you can do scripting just entirely inside your own window, right? Entirely with inside your browser window, and it's not necessarily going to involve any sort of outside application. So simple one for that for playing videos. 
you write some little program, a little script that connects to the video source and pulls the data. So if it's showing a video, it's going to pull the image frames one after another and pull the audio stream. And that particular script you can embed in an HTML tag so it runs automatically whenever the page is loaded into the browser. Now, just doing this natively in the browser as opposed to with a secondary application, again, fewer security issues. So number one, you're not installing an application, giving it permission to access some of your data. Number two, videos have a very standard format, right? There should only be some image frames and an audio stream. So all of those actions can be constrained by the browser. You can basically say, I asked for this video, send me the stream of frames. All I'm gonna do with that content is display it in a little rectangular part of my window and I'm not gonna let it access any sensitive information. And last, you can have standard formats enforced through APIs, which makes it easier to detect malicious code. So APIs, application programming interfaces, you could say, here's what I expect a video frame to look like. It's going to be an image, it's gonna have some header that says how many pixels wide and tall and how many frames it is, maybe there's some compression there, whatever. However, you're receiving the video frames in a standard format, if it's malware, if it's something malicious going on, it's going to look different. And the API isn't going to accept it as a standard video frame. Okay, so there's two kinds of scripting. One we've seen, we've seen client-side scripting. So that's JavaScript, basically, although there are other ones. In client-side scripting, the script code actually runs on your machine. So there's some JavaScript embedded in an HTML tag. When the page gets loaded, it automatically includes the script, and the script runs whenever it needs to. Now, typically for scripting, uh, for client-side scripting, they're gonna be short and simple programs. So you don't wanna slow down the page load too much, right? So if it's going to be some, some little thing that say pulls stock price data or pulls an ad from a web page, yeah, that's gonna be as simple as it can. You don't need to load some monster application for that. Number two, client-side scripting in general improves running speed because for anything you're gonna do, there's no sort of request response communication cycle. So. For example, if you want to play Angry Birds on your machine, what would happen back in the day of Flash is that you would go to some Angry Birds site and you would try to play it. It would download a whole bunch of data, right? It would design, uh, download the basic engine required to play the game. And then once you had all that and you had the information for what level you had, where the pigs were, what kind of birds you had, that sort of stuff, you could just play it within the browser window. You had all the information needed to play the game without connecting to an outside data source, which is obviously much faster than if every pixel you do, every time you pull back the bird in the slingshot of pixel, there has to be some request response from the server. You don't want that. And for the server side, it's nice too, because generally it doesn't generate any extra traffic, right? You download the program, the program runs locally on the client machine, and you only have to contact the server when say you're changing levels and you need to get information about the next level. Okay. The other side is server side scripting. So in server side scripting, the script exists and runs remotely on a server. So we'll talk about this for a minute. Maybe we are gonna run a little over today. Okay, that's all right, we'll talk about PHP. Imagine if I have a web page and it's stored on a server somewhere. Okay. Web page stored on server. And here's the client machine. So, client machine request website, request web page. Request the web page. Okay. Suppose this web page needs to be constructed, right? You need to get some, whatever, some current information. So there's a database or other outside information. Okay, what can happen is that the server, that'll do it. The server requests current data. There's going to be a database that'll have it. The database will send it back. Sends back the response. And the server constructs the whole page. 
right? And then once it has that, it can send it back to the client. So this works for cases like, for example, suppose you go to Facebook, right? Suppose you go to Facebook You need to see your feed. Well, Facebook doesn't just have a copy of your feed page lying around waiting for you. They have to construct it. They have to build it. Okay, so what they do over here, run a PHP script, all right? PHP is just this server-side script that calls for data, and integrates it into page HTML for the client. Well, basically what happens, it it's, knows what it needs to get for your feed. So it says, hey, here's the user, here's the current time, sends a request to the database. The database builds however many, right? Maybe your next 20 or 40 entries in your feed, sends it back to you. Server constructs that, takes that script, turns it into HTML, right? Replaces PHP with HTML and sends a page back to the client. So that's how it works. There's a script that runs here on the server, but the client never actually sees it. The client never sees the PHP script, only the result, the resulting HTML. Okay. So that's server-side scripting. And again, notable characteristics, number one, the actual script code is hidden from all users. That helps with security because you don't get to see how it's actually constructed. Uh, typically, the scripts are gonna load faster and can be more complex because they don't have to be delivered to the client machine. They're running right there on the server and the server has a very nice connect with some backend database. And it's easier to securely integrate with backend databases because if we look at this image here, all this stuff, all right, all this here, this is all behind the wall of the organization, however you choose to define it. This whole setup here behind the organizational wall, organizational wall, and it can be treated as secure. The database says, oh yeah, the server, he's asking for some stuff. Sure, I'm gonna give it, it's not as, uh, Secure, it's not going to be as concerned about security as it would be if some random person from the outside connected directly to the database. The database is going to assume that the server has correctly validated whoever is accessing it and that you know the request that's being passed on is okay. All right, now HTML5, remember HTML is the primary language of web pages. Uh, HTML5 is the latest version. There haven't been a whole lot lately. So HTML5 first released in 2014. The previous version, uh, 4.0, was from the late 90s. So it had been a while. It had been about 16 years between versions. And you can still find pages out there that use HTML4, especially ones that do not have uh, a lot of active content. But the big thing about HTML5 is it has a lot of functions to make plugins unnecessary and generally improve security. So that's what HTML5 is for. As far as active content, right, anything that's supposed to change when a viewer is looking at the page, interacting with it, basic model for that, the web page is going to reserve some component space for the application to run. So back in HTML4, you had a couple of options. Number one, you could have an inline frame, which is basically some kind of tag, uh, an iframe tag, which is a way of accessing third-party data. So this iframe tag delegates some content delivery to a third party. For example, if you wanted to show an ad from some outside source on your web page, you would have an iframe tag in there that would just say, when you load this page, send a call to that data source to fill up this iframe tag with the ad. Or the other option number two, you have some local plugin application. application. The client is running the plugin that's gonna process and display all this data. So for example, back in the day, if you went to YouTube, you tried to watch a video, you needed to have Flash Player in place so that you could actually watch the videos. The browser window would deliver the video stream for you, but you needed the video player to actually interpret it as a playable video. Now with HTML5, these options are still possible. They still exist. 
However, the HTML language now includes a new specification that can basically do all the things a plugin could do for active content. For example, the video data in one of many standard formats can be correctly interpreted and displayed in the web browser itself. You don't need a separate application for it. All right. Now, more generally, let's talk about interfacing. So suppose you have two applications that need to communicate with each other. For example, you have the YouTube video application, however YouTube is sending you videos, and then your web browser is the other application. Well, those two apps are going to need a common language, some kind of interpretation process in order to understand each other. And that's where interfaces come in. Interfaces are the tool that allows this translation. So essentially, any inputs to one application have to be in a standard format or else the receiving application will reject it. And anything the application sends out as a response also needs to be in a standard format or likewise, the application receiving it on the other side will, will reject it. Now this kind of standard interface is very important because it's another way of dealing with all the different uh, software and hardware types out there. So suppose, for example, the universe had only one web browser and only one video application. In that case, because there's only one of each, there could only be one unique browser video app pairing, right? There's one browser, there's one video player. Sure, you design an interface for those two. So you need one because the browser and video app don't speak the same language. You need that translation process. But since there's only one, you could custom design it to work really well for those two specific applications. But of course, if there are many browsers and many video apps, and for that matter, many different video compression formats, there are going to be many different combinations of those, right? So there are many different app pairings. And if you want to customize every different one of those, that's going to require a whole lot of different interfaces, right? Basically, for every video application, you'd need to make a format for every browser. For every browser, you'd need to make a, uh, an output format for every video application. And that doesn't even include the possibility of, again, many different video formats. So it'd be a big hassle. It is much cheaper, much faster to simply adopt one standard. Say, there's one way we're going to do this. Here's what we expect video stream data to look like. And then as long as both sides uh, follow along with that, yeah, it works well. You don't have to design many interfaces. Now, it's not going to be super customized. The performance may not be precisely, the pr performance won't be precisely optimal. But the trade-off is it's a lot less work. So APIs, application programming interfaces, they're the technology that enforces the standard communication model between applications. So a uh, simple example, suppose you're playing a video. So a video is just a set of image frames and there's a special uh, specified delay between frame displays. For example, if you're showing 25 frames per second, then every 0 0.04 seconds, you would know it's time to show a new frame. And when you have this stream of video content, you could either send single frames one at a time, or you could send clusters of sequential frames. For example, if there's a sequence where for two seconds, the image on screen doesn't change, you could say, here's a copy of one frame, and then for the next 50 frames, just repeat this one. And there's various ways that the data could be uh, sent, compressed, various video formats, whatever, as the interface is going to allow a variety of popular styles. Maybe not every, well, it can't uh, include every style that's out there because somebody could always make a new one right, that doesn't conform to the standard, but basically all the popular ones that are out there, yeah, your interface is going to tolerate those. So your API design is standard options. You might say, okay, we're going to accept single frames and we're going to accept bundled frames in any uh, widely used compression technologies and video formats. And again, most of the formats that are out there will be readable, but maybe not all. So if you have an older version of the API and somebody comes up with a new compression style, yeah, you're not instantly going to be able to run that video, to view that video until you get an update to your API. Okay, now practical, application, uh, practical implications for this for YouTube Number one, way back when, right, several years ago, YouTube relied on plugins, for example, Flash Player. So standard video browsers didn't have the video capability. Uh, you could watch the video through Flash. You needed a separate application. Well, all that video data has to get stored somewhere in the browser as it's playing, right? So we know that the browser caches video data, right? But there's a buffer for it. It all gets stored in there. One thing you could do with that format, typically you could save the video directly through the web page by right clicking on it. There would be an option, save the video. And some video sites that use older code, yeah, you can still get that. But the switch to HTML5, number one, 
not only improved security, but made it harder for users to avoid ads. They would, uh, you can't simply download the video in most cases. And because if you're using it with a plugin, the video gets saved as a temporary file. And then that all that data has to be shared with the plugin application. If it's just showing within your browser, it doesn't get need to get stored anywhere except inside your browser cache. And it's gonna be a little harder to get to. So the switch to HTML5 not only improved security, also made it harder for users to avoid ads. They couldn't just download the video straight away. Instead, if they wanted to watch it, they'd have to go to the site, sit through whatever ads there were and deal with that. So again, with HTML5, video content gets delivered to stored in the web browser. It is still possible to extract the data. It's just more of a headache. It's not as easy as just clicking on something and saving the file. And thus again, harder for videos to avoid seeing, viewers to avoid seeing ads. Okay, so I guess we did finish on time. I was thinking uh, number slide stuff. Any questions about any of this? I know I kind of zipped through, but I'll ask. We're gonna stop sharing for a moment. How's everybody? Oh, we got a chat thing. Let's see what we got. Oh, nothing. That's interesting. Uh, no, the 415 session. Oh, he's gone. Okay, maybe I answered that right when the session started. Okay, so I'm going to shut this down. We're going to stop recording.